Hello and welcome to Maranatha Baptist Church, our e-services, as we continue uh, serving our church through the internet and electronic devices as we are in the midst of the quarantine. I hope you are doing well. To my knowledge, everyone from our church is healthy and no one has been infected, so continue to pray that that would continue to be the case, not only in our church, but uh, again throughout the state and throughout the country, and we're looking forward to God resolving this and Him receiving all the honor and glory for the healing. Uh, as we have did last week, we're going to do this week, we're going to say our memory verse uh, that the church has designated for this year, Psalm 119. Just to give you again some context, Pastor Corey and I are um, taping this on Tuesday, and we're going to be airing it obviously on Wednesday, so that's the beginning of April, so we need to add another verse to our memory selection, and so we're going to be doing Psalm 119, 1 through 4. So grab your Bible. You may have had it turned to Isaiah 53. Just flip it back a couple of pages. Go to Psalm 119, and we're going to say verses 1 through 4 together. So let's do that right now. Psalm 119, 1 through 4. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Psalm 119, 1 through 4. Let's say that again one more time. Psalm 119, 1 through 4. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquities. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Psalm 119, 1 through 4. Excellent job. I hope uh, that is coming back to you in, in some ways because we memorized this several years ago, and uh, hopefully you're able to recall it. Now you can take your Bible and turn over to Isaiah 53. This is where we will be for this evening's message. As I thought about this message, it came to me this uh, metaphor. You know, there's a couple of ways to become physically full with food. Either you can eat a lot of food and you fill up, or the thing that you eat is so rich, you become full, or you, that's all you desire. One of my favorite desserts is cheesecake. And if uh, you eat a rich piece of cheesecake, you don't need uh, the whole pie, though sometimes I do desire it. Uh, you don't need the whole pie, but just a, a nice chunk, a little sliver of it. And because it is so rich, it fills you up or you do not want any more. And for tonight, that's kind of the illustration that best represents what we're going to take a look at. We're only going to look at two really short phrases out of the book of Isaiah but they are so rich, they're going to fill us up. Our souls should leave this study uh, that we're doing currently filled. And we're not going to cover a lot of ground, but we should leave here totally satisfied with what we have studied this evening. So let's go ahead and take your Bible, Psalm, or not Psalm, Isaiah 53, 1 through 5. We covered 1 through 3 last Wednesday evening, and we're going to move on to 4 and 5. Actually, just a couple of phrases out of 4, but let's take a look at this whole thing. Psalm, or Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, 
The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Lord, we are so grateful to be in your presence. I thank you that even though we cannot be physically together, that your word is not constrained by these physical limitations. Your word goes forth in power no matter what the medium would be through which it is transmitted. I pray tonight, Lord, that the richness of these words we are going to study would permeate our hearts and souls, and we would be filled with this truth. Lord, we thank you for your goodness unto us, and we ask your blessing upon this time, the prayer time to follow, and we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'd like to introduce tonight's lesson by bringing up the testimony of someone who lived in the 1800s. His name was Charles Simeon. And some of you may or may not have heard of him. Again, he was in the 1800s. He pastored a church in England for 54 years. And we're going to look at endurance this coming Sunday out of the book of Second Peter. And if you want to see that in person, uh, you could study uh, Pastor Simeon's life. But the point, the part of his life I want to emphasize for tonight is when he joined the, or started to attend the seminary. And like, I would imagine some people who attend seminary, uh, Pastor Simeon was not saved. And he was going to Cambridge and he arrived on campus and they told him within a matter of three weeks he would have to participate in the Lord's table. And Pastor Simeon at that time realized he was in no spiritual condition to partake of the Lord's table. So he thought he better prep himself. So he prepared himself by reading some books. And I'm not sure what passage he came across. It could have been Leviticus 16. It could have been this passage that we're going to study tonight. But he came across the passages that teach that the Jewish people could transfer the guilt of their sins to the head of their offering. So the Jewish people, there was this offering, and in Leviticus, it's scapegoats, two goats, and the high priest could confess the sins of the people onto the head of the goat, and their sins were transferred. And that truth arrested Pastor Simeon. He thought, can this be true? May I transfer the guilt of my sins to the head of an offering? If that's true, has God provided for me an offering that I may transfer this guilt from my sins? And if it is true, if that is true, then I want to do it immediately. Now, again, I do not know if Pastor Simeon was reading Leviticus or if he was reading another passage or maybe he was reading Isaiah 53. But if he were not reading Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53 clearly teaches what Pastor Simeon was experiencing. And you may be asking, how so? Well, there are three Ps that introduce us to the importance of what is going to be taught in Isaiah 53. And these three Ps are prophecy, Isaiah 52, 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. Now, I hope you have this marked down in your Bible. That word prudently it can also be translated prosper, so that the RSV has it translated this way. Behold, my servant shall prosper. Guaranteed success is what the verse is trying to tell us. So we should be reading Isaiah 53 to find out what this success, how this servant of God is going to prosper. Not only is there a prophecy regarding, there's a proclamation in Isaiah 52, 7, where it says up there, how beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him that bringeth good tidy, tidings, excuse me, that publish 
peace. So these good tidings that publish salvation, it's proclaiming that this success is going to happen. And then, so we have the prophecy, we have the proclamation. Thirdly, we have personal testimony. And that begins in verse number four. Run your eyes over to that passage of scripture. The word starts out, surely. And you want to get your pen out, underline that. And in your margin or in your notes, write, surely is a strong word of affirmation. <clears throat> In context, what is believed in verse 4 is in contrast to the previously held belief of verse 3. What they're saying is they, they had verse 3 wrong. Verse 4 is saying, surely, oh, we had it wrong, but this is what was truly going on. This strong word of affirmation. We got it wrong in verse 3. We got it right in verse 4. So what in the world did they get right in verse 4 that they had in verse num had wrong in verse number 3? Well, let's take a look at Isaiah 53, 4. And let's read that the first couple phrases. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now that is quoted in the Gospel of Matthew. And as you can see on your screen, I've highlighted in yellow or whatever color it's coming across on your device, borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I want you to tuck those away in your head because as we read Matthew 8, 16, I want you to see how Matthew translates those words. This is important, so mark them down, take your Bible, Put, a, put your finger or notes in Isaiah 53, go over to Matthew 8, and let's read Matthew 8 together, okay? Matthew 8, 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, now look how he translate this, himself took on not our griefs, but our, that's right, infirmities, and bear our, not sorrows, but sicknesses. Okay? So griefs and sorrows are replaced with infirmities and our sicknesses. Now turn back to Isaiah 54, and let's take a look at those words there. Verse 4, griefs, as it is translated, make a note. You find that word 24 different times in the Old Testament. It is translated griefs only here. Otherwise, it is translated sicknesses, illnesses, afflictions, or Matthew, infirmities. Okay? Sorrow or pain or sorrow is translated 11 out of the 14 times in the Hebrew Bible as the word pain. Obviously, what Jesus is doing is he is healing people of some physical illnesses. He's doing miracles. He's doing the miraculous in the realm of healing people of physical sicknesses. Now, he did that a lot. There are 35 miracles recorded in the Gospels. 23 of them are healings. Three of them, there are raising, where he is raising people from the dead. And multiple examples of cluster healings. What do I mean by cluster healings? The Bi and I'm paraphrasing here. The Bible may say something like, and they brought all, the, the whole town came out to him and he healed them, or they brought the multitudes to them and he healed them. That's what I'm referring to in cluster healings. Now, how does this relate to Pastor Simeon having this great revelation revealing to him 
of the ability to lay hands on a sacrificial offering and the transfer of guilt. Well, let's dig in and start unpacking all of these truths, all right? Personal testimony, going back to that personal testimony, testimony, we were looking at what we thought was absolute rejection by God. Verse number three, this is what the people thought. They thought what was important was that God was rejecting Jesus in verse number three. These sorrows and these griefs, that's what they thought was important. But what they came to realize in verse number four, surely or of a truth, he hath borne our griefs and carried our offenses. We were focused on the, the um, sorrows and grief in verse three. What we should have been focused on was what he was doing right in front of our eyes with these healings. We were looking at the sorrow and affliction, and when we did that, we missed it. We missed the importance. We missed the success of God's servant. We should have been watching what he was doing when he was healing people. How so? Well, the blessing is in the verbs that are used in verse number four. The verbs in verse number four of Isaiah 53 is what is going to start the unloading, our ability to understand how this servant of God is going to be successful. Look at the word, surely he hath borne. In Isaiah 54, or 53, 4, born means to pick up and to carry. Okay? Next, look at the word carried. That word is the word shouldered. So let's put those two things together, all right? Jesus, he lifted up our sicknesses and shouldered them, and he carried them away. Jesus is bearing away. He is shouldering other people's illnesses. This passage is saying more than he just healed us. The passage, as a matter of fact, isn't even focused on the people who are being healed. The focus of the passage is, what is Jesus doing in the midst of all of this? And what is going on is, Jesus is shouldering, Jesus is carrying away these illnesses. And that introduces us to this topic, to this word, to this theological truth. Vicarious, substitutionary atonement. Somebody else is doing the work. Somebody is carrying something of mine away. And this is what Pastor Simeon was beginning to grasp when he was reading about these Jewish people being able to lay their guilt and their sin upon this goat, and that goat was carrying their sins away. But in this context, in Matthew's gospel, they're watching these people be healed, but the gospel writer isn't trying to emphasize the people being healed. It's trying to emphasize what Jesus is doing, and what he is doing is he is carrying, he is shouldering their infirmities. All right? Now, what's that all about? What, why is that important? Okay? Okay. Before Adam and Eve sinned, things were perfect. Now, we had a lengthy discussion in our men's Sunday school group what that meant, so we're not going to rehash that here. Whatever you understand to be perfect, that's what the Garden of Eden was, okay? And it, that uh, understanding can grow as you grow in the Lord, but whatever it is to you right now, that's what it was. But when Adam and Eve sinned, everything changed. Okay? Now, I have on the screen 
what happened. Much of our uncomfortableness, and the reason I put much, is because Adam and Eve weren't just sitting around in the garden. They were to till it. They were to expand the garden. And there could have come a day when Adam, in the midst of trying to expand the garden, he hit his hand with the stone. And did that? would that have hurt? I'm thinking, yes, that would have felt uncomfortable. He would have just responded in a sinless way. But that's why meaning... I don't want to say that there was no pain, no uncomfortableness in the garden, because there could have been, but the majority of the uncomfortableness and certainly all of, all of our sorrows are the result of the fall. Sin had consequences. That's what we're trying to understand here. In regard to our sinning, to Adam and Eve sinning, there was consequences. And God was just to take Adam and Eve out of the garden. God was just to allow the sorrows and these consequences of sin to enter in the world. It only makes logical sense. Should people be allowed to live in their sin? Should people be allowed to live in debauchery and it still them still be allowed to live in God's paradise? That doesn't make any sense. All right, but these people, they, we sin, and the consequence of those sins, one of them is that we become ill. Now, the Bible does not teach that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between our sinning and getting sick. In other words, we can't say, if I get bronchitis, oh, that must be for the sin I did two weeks ago. Oh, I have pneumonia. Oh, I broke my toe. Oh, this there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. And we know that because of what happened to the man who was born blind. The people, the apostles were arguing among themselves, I, I think he sinned. The other group were saying, no, I think uh, his mom and dad sinned. Finally, they had to go to Jesus. And Jesus, could you settle this? Who sinned? The guy's mom and dad, or did he sin? And Jesus said, neither one of them. So here we see that there's not this one-to-one -one correlation of sin, but there is the consequence of sin. Is One of the consequences is that we get sick. There are illnesses, all right? So what is going on? Jesus is temporarily removing the consequence of these individuals' sin. Right, The consequence of sin, one of the consequences is we get sick. And Jesus is removing the consequence of this. It's not permanent, and it's not, he's not removing all the consequences. He's just removing this one of the illness. Why do we know he's not removing all of them? Because they're still going to go home to their gardens, and their gardens are still going to have thistles and weeds in them, and they're still going to have to pluck them out. All right? So he's not removing all the consequences of sin. It's not permanent because these people are going to die eventually. It's a temporary. It's Jesus showing that he can bear away the consequences of sin. All right? I'm giving you a preview. What Jesus is doing is giving us a preview of what he's going to do on a grand scale when he dies on the cross and does bear away all of those consequences. Now, how can God justly allow this to happen? All right. What is the foundation for God temporarily uh, removing the consequences of sin. How come when Adam and Eve did sinned in the garden, how come God did not immediately destroy them? And the answer, the proper answer is common grace. Common grace is, allows God to deal with us without judging us. Now, here's the problem. We receive grace instead of justice, and therefore our understanding of justice can be skewed because we 
have received grace, this common grace. But we must understand God shows grace because of his justice. Because God has exercised justice in Jesus Christ, it allows him to be able to give us or to demonstrate to us grace. This is what was going on in Isaiah 53. The people were saying in verse number three, Jesus was such a blasphemer. It left God no other option but to unleash his wrath on him and to punish him. And to that's why he's suffering, because he is such a bad person. God is unleashing his wrath. And they only got it partially right. God was unleashing his wrath, but it wasn't because of Jesus' sin. Look at verse number five. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He wasn't being punished because he was bad. What was going on was he was bearing the consequences of our sins. That's what's going on. That's why it says, verse number four, surely we got it wrong. He isn't being punished because he's bad. He's bearing, he is carrying, he is shouldering our griefs and our sorrows so that we can escape the consequences of sin. That's what's going on in Jesus on the cross. The backbone of uh, our message on this past Sunday, essential virtues. These precious promises, God's great expectations. How can God have such great expectations of me? Because Jesus not only removed the sin from your life, he made you whole. And what Jesus is doing on the cross isn't only dealing with sin, he's removing the consequences of sin from your life. That's why he can expect you to act a different way. As I just mentioned, you once who were dead and empty are full and made whole. Why? How? Because Jesus removed. He carried away. He put on his shoulders. He bore the consequences of our sins. He took them away. He has carried them away. Just like that goat that maybe Pastor Simeon was reading about in Hebrew, or excuse me, Leviticus chapter 16, 17, putting those sins upon the guilt of those sins upon that goat, and he carried them away. That's what Jesus is doing. So what, and what they're saying in this passage is, we should have been looking at what Jesus was doing when he was healing these people. All we saw was that sick people were made better. But there was so much more to it. He was shouldering the consequences of our sins. And God is able to treat us with common grace. How come it rains on the just and the unjust? How come the sun shines on the just and the unjust? Because of God's common grace. Why? Because he's poured the sin onto his son. That's why he can show us grace. That's why any of us receive grace. God has demonstrated grace. God poured out those sins on his son long before you and I gave our hearts to Jesus Christ. What about the times before salvation when you and I did wrong? How come God didn't strike us down? Because Jesus Christ bore our sins. That's what was going on. Now, there's consequences. There are some people that will never come to the realization by their own choosing that God's goodness, the reason he hasn't struck them dead, God's goodness is to lead them to repentance, but they will pass that by. 
they will not see it. That Jesus actually is bearing their sins, but they won't apply that to, they won't accept it by faith in their lives. What this passage is teaching us in verse number four of Isaiah 53, surely what's going on with Jesus is that he is shouldering, he is carrying away the consequences for our sins. Therefore, I can be new. I can do these things God wants for me to do. We're going to finish up those virtues listed in 2 Peter 4, 5, and 6, or 5, 6, and 7, excuse me. How can God have any expectation of me doing that? Because his son carried away the consequences of my sins. That's what he's doing. And what this is just the confession of the of uh, whoever was writing this in Isaiah, these passages, that they got it wrong. They were looking at Jesus and saying, what did he do to deserve that kind of wrath from God? And what they should have been saying, or should have been what, you know what? He's carrying away the wrath God intended for me. He is the substitute. He is doing this vicariously in my place. And because of that, I can be made new. I can be made whole. What glorious truths God is teaching us here. Next week, we're going to pick up here where we left off. This surely he hath borne our griefs and carried away our sorrows. And we'll move on with the, the next portion and continue rolling through this. But folks, let the richness of what Christ has done for us and shouldering the consequences of our sin, let the richness of that dwell in us richly. All right, at this time, we are going to go to our prayer time, our prayer sheets. If you have one, maybe you kept the one from last week. So we're going to add to it. Excuse me as I grab a drink here. First of all, we want to pray for Brenda's sister. Her husband, Brenda's sister's husband, passed away. And so be praying for comfort uh, during this time of grief. Also, you can add uh, my boss. His name is Matt to your list. About a month ago, his mother uh, passed away. This past Sunday, his father passed away. None of this was expected. And so you can imagine the grief that he is going through, he and his family. So if you could remember uh, my boss, Matt, and his family, that would be great. Jody, again, continue to pray for her. Brenda and Bob and uh, Jenny, appreciate you praying. Uh, she is not allowed to receive visitors, and this is stressful. Bob and Brenda and Jenny and Kevin usually are over there on a regular basis. Brenda assured me she's receiving the love and care from the staff, but it's just, you know, it's not, it's not family, not close family. Be praying for her. The continued the healing of Rosa. She is still suffering the consequences of this Crohn and infection, Crohn's disease and the infection, so be praying for her. Uh, there are still people who need or are seeking unemployment and need uh, for that unemployment to be set up so they can be receiving a cash flow. And we are seeking to restart our connections program. And there are a lot of uh, things that need to be worked out. So be praying that we can get all our ducks lined up in a row and be able to get this program going. We are also going forward with setting up and developing the release time for the Hillsdale School District. So be praying for everyone involved in that. Many people have been asking about our missionaries. Has anybody uh, come down with corona that we're supporting? To my knowledge, as of Tuesday, March 31st, I am not aware of any one of our missionaries whom we support uh, going through this. But I do have uh, received three prayer sheets missionary reports this week. So I want to uh, share with you some requests. Marilyn Pitzer, 
She has skin cancer, which is being treated. Uh, she just she had one treatment, and they saw that uh, they missed some spots, so she's going back to have those spots addressed, so be praying for her. She is trying to put together a hymnal for the tribe down in Venezuela, so be praying that that would go well, the translation. And petatine or petatine is still in need of surgery, and because of the lockdown down in Venezuela, the uh, quarantine, uh, he is unable to get to the hospital and have that done, so be praying for him. Also, I think this friend who has a granddaughter who is in need of heart surgery, I think she's in Florida, but whether she's in Florida or Venezuela, it makes no difference. There's a, a lady, friend of Marilyn, granddaughter, uh, I think an infant under one year of age who's in need of heart surgery, so be praying for her. Stan Templeton shared uh, his sheet. Uh, there's a lockdown in Peru. Be praying they cannot get out. One person is allowed to leave uh, to go out one time per day for groceries. Otherwise, they are in lockdown and consequently uh, very little fellowship going on. And so be praying for that situation. And Steph and Steph, Steve and Beth Galt uh, sent a letter. They're both doing well. They are working from home. So be praying that they would be able to stay in touch with the missionaries in Africa and be an encouragement to them. So if you have any additional requests, please send them to me or give me a call. I will be glad to add them. We, Pastor Corey and I are praying for everyone. We do look forward to the time that we can be together. Uh, but in the meantime, this is our best option and we're staying with it. And also we look to improve our services this upcoming Sunday and you'll just have to tune in to see what that improvement also, I hope you enjoyed the little advertisement that we ran last week. There could be another one in the works, not sure, but stay tuned. But what a privilege because of the work, the finished work of Jesus Christ, we can go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, and so we're going to do so at this time. Would you please join me in prayer? Dear gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, how grateful we need to be that Jesus not only paid for our sins, that he shouldered the consequence of them as well. And because of that, what hope is unleashed in my soul? The things that you desire for me are surely a, are able to be accomplished. I pray that the richness of this truth would sink deep within our hearts. And we would have a spirit overflowing with joy towards our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I lift up these requests. I pray for Brenda's sister and her family. I pray for Matt and his family as they have suffered the loss of loved ones. And Lord, there is not a magic formula we have that takes away the pain, but you can bring comfort and we can be there to comfort as vessels of yours during this time. And so, Lord, we do pray for the comforting of these families during this time of grief. Lord, I lift up Jody. And, Lord, again, the comfort that you can provide that passes our understanding, you can provide to Jody as she's unable to have physical contact with Bob and Brennan, Jenny and Kevin. And I pray that... Um, even though in their absence, Lord, you would fill her heart with your presence and knowing that her family loves her and her friends as well love her deeply and that her heart can be full with that knowledge. Those seeking unemployment, Lord, <clears throat> we trust in you. We trust in the vehicles that you bring our way to meet our needs. And this, these individuals believe this is a way that you would deem justifiable in obtaining an income. And I pray that you would work, them, work that out for them. As we restart our connections program, I pray that you would work out the kinks, that things would go smoothly. And Lord, if we are missing something that we haven't thought about, that, uh, that unforeseen circumstance, would you bring that to our attention? And may we be able to be used of you to continue to minister to these young men who are part of the Connections program. 
Lord, um, we also pray for the meetings that are going on for the release time at the Hillsdale School. And so, Lord, may those, the pieces of those puzzles be put together and so that things could be worked out, that we could share the truth about Jesus Christ beginning next year. Lord, how we pray that this virus would cease, that those who are ill would be made whole. And Lord, if you would choose to allow this to go on, Lord, that we, your children, would see the opportunities that are available for us to be instruments of your love, to be conduits of your grace and mercy, that we would take advantage of these opportunities. And that, Lord, people would see your love through us. We are to image you. May they see that. Lord, I lift up the request. Pray for healing of Marilyn Pitzer. Pray that her friend's granddaughter would be able to receive the surgery. This gentleman that is in need of surgery in Venezuela, that that would take place. That the work on the hymnal would go uh, without a hitch and that would be able to be published and used down in Venezuela. For the Templetons, I pray that in this time of isolation, that their fellowship with you, the other brothers and sisters in Christ in Venezuela who are isolated, their fellowship with you would be just exponentially greater than it has been at any other time in their walk with you. And I thank you that Steve and Beth Galt are doing well. Continue to use them for vessels of yours to reach the people of Africa and to encourage the missionaries there. How we do thank you, Lord, for this time of prayer. We are so privileged to be able to ask them all in your son's name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next time this Sunday morning.